All right, so I want to shift a little bit to foreign policy because I think that's sort of uh, one of your one of your. Would you say that's one of your main strengths? Look, my my, <laughs> my claim to fame was counterterrorism and stuff like this, but but really deep down, I, I'm a strategy wonk. Yeah, grand strategy is my thing. Okay, so we'll talk we'll talk in the lens sure. of strategy then. Yeah. So as we're taping this right now, I mentioned earlier, it's gonna it's gonna sit on the shelf for a couple days. Um, so I don't want to get too lost in anything that happened today. But at the moment, it, it's a little upside down in Syria. We don't. There might have been strikes already from when we're taping this. Uh, Hungary just had elections. Um, in your Wikipedia that I referenced earlier, it says you worked for the, for the guy who just won. You. Apparently, you never worked for him. You I worked for his party. I wasn't Viktor Orban's advisor. No. Yeah, which is what it says on Wikipedia, right. at least. Um, wh what's your general thoughts on foreign policy strategy? Like, what is a sensible <laughs> policy? And, and is Trump applying yeah. that view? Uh, first things first, uh, the great irony of our nation is that we are the most powerful nation the world has ever seen. And until recently, we have been the dumbest and most astrategic. I mean, we haven't done, we haven't thought or acted strategically since about 1989, November the 9th, when the Berlin Wall fell. And, and this is, you know... Um, How have we acted? What, what would you say that since then, it's just been uh, well, we had, we had The 90s was just this kind of confused, what is national security about? Uh, lurching for the snooze button, just... Who, who are the threats? Is it China? Is it weapons of mass destruction? Is it Yugoslavia? It was just a mess. And then we had 2001 and 9-11, and we had just neocon disasters. And it's not an accident that these guys were former Trotskyites, because they're so naive at the way they look at the world, that we're, we're going to create democracy at the end of a gun barrel in a country with 36 languages that defeated Alexander the Great and the British Empire and the Soviets. You couldn't be stupider if you tried. <laughs> so, you know, we, 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 we've done some very, very foolish things because we haven't stuck to the basics. Strategy, at the end of the day, is about one thing. It's about prioritization based upon interests, right? You've got to say, some things are more important than others. And guess what? Some countries are more important than others. And in a post-modern secular world, you're not allowed to, oh no, all countries, oh, Vanuatu is as important as Turkey. <laughs> Wrong, it's not. I mean, I love the people of Vanuatu, but no, it's not a geostrategic import to the, to the country of, uh, of America. So number one, we have to prioritize. And I think this administration, I doff my cap to Nadia Shadlow, uh, uh, H.R. McMaster's deputy. She held the pen in the meetings that I was in on the new national security strategy of America. And I tell you, David, it is the first document of that name in 30 years that deserves the name national security strategy. Every administration has them. This is the first one that says, this is what we stand for. These are our values. These are our friends. These are our enemies. And this is what we're going to prioritize. Prior to that, it was laundry lists of, well, we're going to have two front wars. We're going to save the whales. And you know, no. So you have to prioritize. And finally, this administration is about America first. Uh, we are not isolationists nor are we interventionists. This is really annoys me, that if you're a conservative, for 20 years you were given two options. Button A, invade other people's countries and occupy them. Mm -hmm. Button B, be you know, a Rand Easter and close the, you know, the curtains on the Pacific and the Atlantic and say, we don't care about anybody else. Well, guess what? As the most powerful nation in the world, there is a large palette of options <laughs> between saying, the two. There's gotta be right? something in the right. middle there, yeah. So it's, it's about being smart, and it's about our interests. And you know, to summarize the president's approach, this isn't official, but I like it. We have numerous former generals and active generals from the Marine Corps at the highest level of the administration, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chief of Staff, Secretary of Defense. And the interesting thing is they all come from the same Marine Corps division. Not just the Marine Corps, the same division. Hmm. And um, that division has a motto, no better friend, no worse enemy. That's America first. So when you see someone like John Bolton mm -hmm. being uh, now part of the cabinet, and if you were to look on, you know, not that you can get truth out of Twitter, but the day it was <laughs> happening, you know, everybody's saying this is gonna start World War III, and you know, just the general hysterics. And now John Bolton is definitely, I suspect more of a neocon than you're comfortable with. Is that I don't think it's fair to call him a neocon. 
Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he's ideologically driven. If you watch the videos that he, you know, were recorded of his speeches 20 years ago, he was sounding very much like Trump. We're America and we have interests. You want to work with us? Fine. If you don't, there's a problem. So, um, and I think it's very telling that within 40 minutes of the president's tweet about John coming on board, um, Ambassador Bolton gave an interview on Fox. And they asked him about what are you going to be like as a national security advisor? And he gave a very interesting answer. He quoted Dean Acheson and you know, the, the, the doyen of foreign policy in America. And uh, I don't know if this is a true story, but John said, Dean Acheson was once, once asked, how do you have such a good relationship with the president you serve? And Dean Acheson said, well, it's very easy. We, we may disagree on policy issues, but at the end of the day, I, I never forget who was elected president, and it wasn't me. That's a John Bolton 2.0. He understands that unlike his predecessor, H.R. McMaster, he's not there to lecture the president or foist his version of what you should do onto the commander in chief. He's there to be an honest broker and provide a palette of options because guess who gets to decide? The person who was elected president. So I am very excited about John and I'm, I'm as excited about Mike Pompeo coming from the CIA to the State Department. The, we are in very good hands, David. So how do you make sure if, if it's between the pure isolationists and, yeah. and the neocons or something, right. something like the nation builders, something like that, mm. how do you make sure that not everything that you do outside of our borders becomes something much bigger? I mean, look, we're still at war in Afghanistan. Right. I don't think anyone knows why. It, I mean, can you, can you tell me why we're at war in Afghanistan? Can anyone I'll, tell I'll us? I'll tell you why, why, we went, why we went to Afghanistan in October of 01 is the only reason we should be there today. Nothing's changed, okay? Uh, the idea that girls go to school, I love it, I get it. And that people can listen to music freely and the Taliban won't execute you. My parents lived under communism. My, my father suffered under fascism. He protected his fellow Jewish classmates during the occupation of Budapest. I get it, I don't like those kinds of systems. But there's only one reason we were there, to make sure that that piece of landmass would never ever again be used to execute mass casualty attacks in Manhattan, in Washington, or in a field in Pennsylvania. End of story. It's not about building a ring road around Kabul that not even the Soviets could finish. Mm -hmm. It's not about building hospitals. I'm sorry, you never make the ideal the enemy of the good. What the president does is he looks at things as questions of possibility. You cannot be a massively successful realtor in the toughest market in, New York, in the world, which is New York real estate, if you have a filter that, that distorts reality. I mean, either this square footage is worth X or it's not worth X, according to the market. And that's how he approaches these issues. So Afghanistan's only important to make sure bad guys don't use it again to kill Americans in America. So you, would, so you would say, or at least if you, if you had to guesstimate basically what he believes, you would say that he believes that still keeping us there at the moment is still accomplishing. Yeah, oh, that, I don't have to guesstimate, I can goal. tell you that. Yeah. So you believe that oh, as well? Because uh, it just seems unclear to me. It has, me, like, nothing, it has yeah. nothing to do, he will, he will never, I, I tell you right, this 71 year old man who is now the most powerful man in the world will never, ever, ever buy into a nation building scenario anywhere outside of the United States. Not happening for the next seven years, end of story. And the idea that you have my followers on Twitter tearing their hair out that Bolton's going to have us invade Syria. <laughs> Guys, get a grip on reality and you know, stop talking about crisis actors and tinfoil hat garbage. It's not going to happen while the president's the president. Well, that's, I tweeted something to that effect the day of the Bolton thing because it also reminds me that people don't understand basic deterrence. Right. That you have to bring in people that, you know, talk a big game so that perhaps North Korea, your enemies... hello. Yeah. Right? The man who was going to take us to war, what did he do? I think the success in North Korea to date has in large part been, part, uh, been uh, uh, thanks to his tweets. Because that's how you deal with dictators. You make fun of them, they hate that, and then you ridicule them, right? And then you do what? You scare them. Oh, and lo and behold, they want to negotiate for the first time in 65 years. Well, isn't that interesting? Do you think there's any chance he would ever <laughs> give up his nukes? About 3%. <laughs> Because at that point, what leverage does he have right. left, right? So yeah. that, right. And, but you still think it's worth having the talks to figure right. out what we can Absolutely, do. Absolutely, because yeah. what's happened for the last 25 years? Escalation, escalation, escalation. I mean, we, we have given into nuclear blackmail since Bill Clinton. 
so yeah, we, we have to, at, at the end of the day, we have to remember 1953 was not a peace treaty. 1953 in Korea was a ceasefire and an armistice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that is actually a war that's just simply been frozen for 65 years. Would be nice to have a little bit of a peace treaty or something. Yeah. How much of what's happening in the world right now <laughs> Do you, you must be thrilled, I assume, with everything going on at the UN, that, oh, Nikki, Nikki, that Nikki Haley, Haley has basically oh, yeah. walked in there and-, and John Bolton 2.0. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she strikes right. me as, I, I almost wonder, did Trump really know what he was getting with her I fully? Didn't. Yeah, did anyone know? I don't know? think anybody did. Yeah, where, where do, you th do, you, do you know her at all? Where do you think that, that comes no, from? No, I don't know her as a friend. Um, she found herself. She found herself and more power to her. What, what usefulness do you see in the UN at this point? Because it seems like, <laughs> truly, it seems like the most corrupt, should be backwards. It should be pushed into the river, I mean, really. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, the building's basically on the river. That's right. So that's right. <laughs> um, now they're going to quote that and go, you see, he was calling for a right. building to be knocked into the river. Um, look, the, the idea was a good idea in 1945 in San Francisco that let's have an organization that stops us from killing 60 million people again. Um, but when you lock in dictatorships like China and Russia into the Security Council with veto power, and then you create this, this empire of UN organizations. I mean, is, has there been a year in the last 20 years that we haven't seen a UN scandal? whether it's money for oil, whether it's UN troops raping children in Africa. Have we seen it one year without a UN scandal? I don't think so. So try and reform it, and if you can't, question the validity of what it does. So forget, I'm not talking about you know, the, 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 the children's rights organizations right. and food, food security. I'm talking about its main mission, which is stability and safety. It's failed abysmally. Yeah, what, what do you make of the endless obsession with Israel? that something like 47 of the last 51 resolutions are against Israel and See, usually, that, usually that, voted on by I, countries. I'm, I'm sorry, but that alone is a reason to dissolve the UN. I mean, what a lack of moral compass. What, what an utter bankruptcy of the morality that, that there are nations in the world that actually still have slavery going on. Slavery, where, where basic human rights for individuals are not guaranteed based upon sex, based upon lifestyle choices. And you're going to lambast Israel, the only real democracy in the Middle East? Yeah, I think, I think you nailed it. I mean, that, that in and of itself is uh, reason enough to question the yeah. future of the UN. So is the US sort of in an odd position where it's like if we don't do anything, nothing can get done, <laughs> yes. sort of. And that, that then puts us endlessly in these quagmires or at least in these positions where we can either watch the world burn or get involved in things where we may end up adding to the burning in the first place. Like for example, you know, with Russia going into Crimea, you know, they gave up their weapons. Right, they gave up the weapons. They said, "All right, NATO's going to take care of us." But what that really means is the United States is going to take care of you. And I'm not saying we should have gone in and, right. and done anything there, but that we're in this endless situation now, where it is either us. There, there is no international fighting. But, force, but again, really, you've right? got to be super careful not to get caught in, in a binary dichotomy. You can absolutely say a world without American leadership is a more dangerous world because it was for the last eight years. Look. I mean, we had a government that actually said, we're going to lead from behind, which is an oxymoron. You cannot lead from behind. We're going to have strategic patience, which means we do nothing and allow others to act. What happened? <laughs> you name it, from China building fake military bases on fake islands, to ISIS, to Russia invading. I mean, it was just a disaster. Egypt, we backed the guy, then we oh backed the other guys, then we backed the other guys. Brother, then we... I mean, so yeah. to say that a world without American leadership is, is more dangerous, is true, but that doesn't mean that we have to fix everybody's problem. And that's, that's where smart strategy comes in, where you say, look, we have a moral duty to espouse certain values, but that doesn't mean we are responsible for all human beings, because, because the American Revolution says the opposite. Right? Each nation is responsible. The citizens are responsible. If you don't like your system, do something about it, because guess what? we did against the most powerful empire in the world. So um, again, it's about finding that, that happy medium in the middle and being smart about it. And again, without being callous, 
being realistic, right? There are atrocities everywhere, from Rwanda to, to, to Yugoslavia. Are American taxpayers going to pay for fixing all of them? Are we responsible? Are they responsible for what's happening in their country? Sure. Are there times when we could perhaps help them? Uh-huh. But it's a balance. Right, it's a balance. All right, so let's shift back to your book here. Yeah. So defeating jihad, it seems to me that the, the main sort of narrative on this is not that we can defeat it, but we should live with it. <laughs> that there's a degree of it with which mm -hmm. we should just live, which is don't carry knives in London. <laughs> and it's, you know, we're gonna put up more barricades so that trucks can't be right. driven into buildings or into shopping centers or just down the street and killing people. That we can't really defeat this ideology, we just have to manage it. Right. I suspect you do not agree with that premise. No, because we've defeated ideologies before. You, you can't, look, there are idiots who run around with, you know, swastika armbands today. I, I get it, so Nazism hasn't disappeared. But we have made it so anathema that if you walk down the street with a Nazi flag, you will be rejected by society instantly. The same thing with the KKK, right? Sadly, not with Che Guevara, or the hammer <laughs> and sickle. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but there are ways to defeat ideologies or to put them in a box where they're laughable and, and everybody shuns them. We have to do the same thing with jihadism. This is my argument. This is the, the conclusion of the book. We have to be as effective in delegitimizing the message of jihad, because uh, very simply put, killing jihadis is great, but at the end of the day, uh, body bags as a metric, not a good metric. It didn't work in Vietnam, doesn't work today, because guess what? If you've got a recruiting pool that's massive, they'll just recruit new jihadis. So what's your victory condition? Your victory condition is when the lifestyle of jihad is no longer sexy, from Brussels to San Bernardino. How do you do that? You make a laughing stock, you discredit that value system. Not us, I mean, a white-skinned Catholic isn't going to do it. Right. But we help President Sisi. We help King Abdullah of Jordan. We help MBS in Saudi Arabia. I mean, MBS, the historic things he said. I mean, massive about Israel in just the last few weeks. Yeah. That's how we win, because sooner or later, enough people say, eh, pff, nah, those guys are losers. That's how we win. But, yeah. but you only do that if you get to talk about it truthfully. You've got to be able to talk about the Quran, what jihad means, the history of the religion, because if you can't talk about it honestly, you're never going to treat it accurately. Yeah, we're not very good at that, though. Well, well thanks I, to political correctness, right? I mean, imagine if you know, you're, you're a doctor and you've got a patient that comes in with you know, third stage you know, lymphoma, but your hospital administrator, because it's a scary word, has banned the use of the word cancer. You can't say it, right? It's just not allowed. Yeah. And then you have to tell the patient what? Well, you know, you're dehydrated, go home, drink some water and take some aspirin. What happens to your patient? They die. It's the same thing. If you can't diagnose a geostrategical issue accurately, however much money you throw at it, you will not solve the problem. So are you concerned at all that just even if it's purely because of the way the media frames things, that perhaps Trump is not the right person to lead the fight against this, that for whatever whatever he's gonna say about jihad or radical t yeah. Islamic terrorism or the rest, that yeah. even if he said everything the exact way that you wanted it to uh -huh. be said, cleanly and clearly and correctly defined right. and all of that, that he may not be the right messenger on this just because of the filter it has to get through to get to reality. He's not the right messenger domestically because of what political correctness has wrought in our country, but he is absolutely the right messenger internationally. Watch the video of his Riyadh speech. Mm -hmm. Don't watch him, watch the 53 Muslim Arab heads of state and their body language, because man, did he, guys, you got a problem in your mosque, in your societies, the extremists, the you have to deal with it, it was tough. And you'd think they'd be all negative and arms crossed. They were beaming, right? Sisi, Abdullah were going, oh, well, finally, <laughs> a, a, fi a guy who understands our problem and what is giving us tough love. So, yeah, he, he is absolutely the right guy to fix this internationally, which is where it needs to be fixed. Domestically, no, the political correctness thing's going to get in the way. Yeah. And, and, and the media insanity. So do you think he has more support from foreign heads of state than, than we'll <laughs> oh, ever have a sense? I mean, even oh, at the G8, there was a feeling of like that actually these guys kind of liked him. Oh. I can tell you, uh, yeah. I told people before the inauguration, you have no idea, even if you voted for him, you have no idea how successful he will be internationally. 
because he's a straight shooter and because he's an alpha dog. And guess what? In a lot of places outside of Berkeley, <laughs> they like that, right? Because they know what you're talking about. They don't have to walk on eggshells. They understand your direction. So yeah, internationally, uh, our, our prestige as a nation has skyrocketed in, you know, outside of the European Union, and maybe you know, certain Central European countries exempted. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I know we could do a whole other show on this, but, but very quickly, just on Russia and mm -hmm. collusion, as someone that has been around the administration, mm -hmm. you've mentioned some of these people already, Flynn, you know, down the road. What, what can you tell me about that? And is there anything that people should be worried about? Or, or, or do you think this is all gonna actually point just back to the Democrats, which every time, oh. it, seems, every time it seems to point to Trump, yeah. you go a little bit further and then you're going, oh, well, wait a minute, that was actually the Democrats doing it. My, my good friend has uh, the best morning show in DC, uh, um, Chris Plant, the, the radio host. It's actually nationally syndicated now. And I have to credit him with this. He, he says, it's the, it's the last scene from The Hunt for Red October. Okay? <laughs> when the bad Captain Tupolev launches the, the, the torpedoes against, you know, Sh uh, Sean Connery on the Red October, and he takes the fuses off. And then what happens? Remember, his exo says, you idiot, you've killed us! The, the, the thing comes back and sinks them. Yeah. This is, this is the, the, the most hilarious boomerang in history, right? I'll tell you what the president told me in the Oval Office, just the two of us. He was very frustrated one day. I think maybe Jared had just testified or given his speech, uh, his little uh, press conference, and he said, they will not find anything because there is nothing. And you know what? I take that to the bank. There is no Russian collusion. How could there be after the last 15 months? From arming the Ukrainians to the XL pipeline to Anwar to finally after 30 years, the first president to ever get NATO to finally stump up the 2% of GDP that they promised they'd spend on defense, to our own military expenditure increases. Every significant policy decision this president has taken with regards to Russia has been bad for that former KGB colonel. So the idea that we're colluding, you have to be on drugs or be so ideologically blind to believe that. Well, then what do we do with this, this layer, you know, whatever that you, you referenced, deep state before, oh, what whatever, do we do like, state? yeah, what, what do we do with this thing? You know, look, we have an ongoing, the, the investigation to me, the Mueller investigation, what seems odd to me is that I don't know what the actual, I don't know that they ever laid out what their mission is other than to find what was something. The crime? What was the crime? Right. And that, Collusion that, is not so, a crime. So collusion to commit, cons to, 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 to con collusion to conspire in a crime, okay, but what's the crime? Because if it's Russia misrepresenting itself or perverting the truth on Facebook, well then Zuckerberg should be <laughs> right charged. Then then you know Anderson Cooper should be in the dock. What are the charges that have been brought? Outrageously ridiculous. Lying to federal investigators. You you would probably be able to be caught in a perjury trap today, okay? Because not everybody remembers what they did and how they did it. Perjury traps about what you said to somebody ir irrespective of Russia, that's not Donald Trump's problem. Wire fraud, eight years ago, when Manafort worked for the Ukrainian president, what's that got to do with Russian collusion? Nothing. My worry is that Mueller is not a good actor. If you look at who he's hired, it's clear that there's massive bias. And this report he's writing for Congress is simply going to be a political weapon in the elections. And, and that's not how justice is served. That's not r rule of law. That's a law enforcement official getting involved in politics. So that's what I'm concerned about also. Whether, whether you think something, for the people that are watching this, that think something happened or didn't happen, what I'm more concerned about is that we're entering this new phase where whether it's Trump that's president or it's a Democrat that's president or it's a different Republican mm -hmm. or whatever, that we're just gonna endlessly also have this layer that all it does is investigate yeah. itself, waste money, right. you know, just constantly just be keeping us all in this state where we never know what's real. Because if you listen to, half of the pundits on television, I mean, their implication is that Russia has installed our president, in which case that's probably the bi single biggest act of war in the history of the world. And what are you actually saying? Do we take Trump out and then do you take out Pence and now should Paul, right. Ryan, I mean, if you take it to its logical conclusion, right. or do we have 
Paul Ryan as what are you president for? then? And right, where are you right. really taking this? Right. And that's what I'm worried about is that we're just going to end up in this constant state where yes, we'll have a Democrat and then a Republican or whatever, but we'll really be caught in just con all government can do is investigate itself yeah. really more than anything else. <sighs> I see myself as an optimist, but you're giving me a real challenge with that last one. <laughs> I see myself as an optimist too, yeah. but I, I think I'm, I'm a realist. So, so also. I, for months and months and months, I refused to use the phrase deep state. I, I really thought that was a you know, tinfoil hatty kind of thing. Yeah. And for the record, I don't even know that I've even said it once on this show. It, right. it, it sort of pops up in ancillary but, but ways. David, I use it now because I've seen it. I've seen it inside the administration. When you go to enough National Security Council meetings that are classified, that is the, 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 the pinnacle of policy making in America outside of the Oval Office. I mean, this is where policy is made. Everybody's in the room from the NSC, then you've got the outstations on secure VTC from DIA, uh, Trevor Joint Chiefs, CIA, State, you name it, right? And you sit there as a newly appointed political and you listen for two hours on a big issue, ISIS, Russia, whatever it is, and not one participant mentions the name of the president or what he said yesterday in Warsaw or what his objective is given that specific issue. And you see this happen again and again and again. And you're the guy at the end of the conversation with a funny accent who says, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, you do know what the president said about X yesterday. Can we actually do that? The deep state is real. When you've got GS-15s and SESs saying, well, pff, I've been here for 20 years. I know this guy's going to be here for four. I know better. That's bad for democracy. So to be clear, though, you don't think it's some sort of massive underground conspiracy. You think it's just the apparatus. Uh, it's just the Look, old Washington apparatus. Sort that, of. I, I don't think I, you know, these people who think Obama's sitting in a cave somewhere with a joystick. <laughs> he's lazy. He'd never be a mastermind. He's not Spectre, right? It's not <laughs> Blofeld. But, but uh, no, th there's a culture in government that's antithetical to an undermining, undermining the president on a daily basis. But, but there, is, there is concerted effort in the media. Oh my gosh. I mean, Ben Rhodes brags yeah. about it. Yeah, that guy's right? unbelievable. When he says, my buddies, the left-wing journalists, are morons and they're my echo chamber, he, he built this machine that was, was this incestuous connection between people in the West Wing, people in the think tank community, and their buddies in the media. I mean, look at the attack pieces on anybody, me or whatever. It's very interesting. Somebody should do a case study at a journalism school. One attack piece will drop at 7 a.m. By 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 30 have yep. been written, which yep. are simply cut and paste. But if you don't know that, it looks as, oh my gosh, Gork is a fascist. No, it's one guy's article that was written because Ben Rhodes told them to write it, that comes and multiplies. On the right, how do we react? Well. I got my op-ed into National Review this month, <laughs> right? Th th there's a gulf in terms of managing narrative. The left built, built a whole ecosystem, and we're still in the 1980s, you know, oh, we'll take out a full page ad in the Washington <laughs> Times. <laughs> well, that's why when discussing right? it, <laughs> yeah, I think it's so important to not, audit. I think most people, especially just because of the way social media works, they immediately go to the full-on conspiracy of Obama yeah. with a joystick or just some other, ver you know, the globalist thing and this whole, where to me it's like, they're, they're, what you just described seems more realistic to me, that there's an apparatus there that then is still connected to the right. media. That seems, with, we, can, we can discuss that in a sensible way. With one addition, and, and, and I, I appreciate this now having been, you know, in the target hairs of the crosshairs for so long. They have an advantage because our side is predicated on what, David? The individual, right? Manifest destiny, the rugged individualism. We believe in the individual. The left, by definition, is a collective entity. I mean, there are elements of the Borg in the left. And it, is a, it truly is a collective, me, collective mob mentality. A friend of mine, Omri, if you're watching, I mean, thank you. There, there is this, when, 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 when one guy goes after Gawker or Bannon or whoever, the president, there's this massive collective pylon. It's not a conspiracy, yeah. but, it, but it's a collect, they're all on the same hymn sheet. They don't need direction, but they say, oh yeah, let's go after him. Which, is, which puts us on the right at a disadvantage. Yeah, so this is just sort of an emergent group thing. It's a culture, yeah. cultural thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. 
we could do, we're, we're going to do this again. I hope so. This is so much fun. Yeah, th this was an absolute pleasure. Uh, for more on Dr. Gorka, can, I feel like I have to say Sebastian. it. Sebastian. I know. Well, I'll call you. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm a pro when I'm doing that later. I'll call you Sebastian. Uh, but I feel like Dr. Gorka. I mean, you should be a Star Wars character. It's all in there. For more on Sebastian, uh, follow him on Twitter. It's at Seb Gorka.